All right, so last week we concluded our series, Love Without Limits, and this week we're beginning a new series. The title of this series... Wow. Okay. All right, there we go. The title of this series is Follow the Leader, and this series is all about the life of real discipleship. Real discipleship. Follow the leader. This, this uh, series is going to focus on what it is to be a real Christian. One of the criticisms that often is heard about the Christian church is this. Tell me if you've ever heard this. Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Have you ever heard that? I think I've heard that. How many have never heard that? Exactly. Christians are a bunch of hypocrites. Now, before we take offense at that kind of... Uh, accusation, let's consider whether or not it's true. Are all Christians really hypocrites? No. Exactly. <laughs> I would say you couldn't say all Christians are hypocrites. That uh, statement is no more valid than saying all of the people that are residents of Seattle are liars. Okay. Now, you could say that, and if you wanted to prove the case, you could probably round together, uh, round up 100 liars from Seattle, and you could say we have verified proof and evidence these people really are liars. They lied on their tax return. They've lied about their weight. They've lied about their age. They've lied about their original hair color. That's true. And you say, that's proof. I've got a hundred of them right there. It proves that all Seattle residents are liars. Well, that doesn't prove anything, does it? That proves a hundred of them are liars. A more accurate statement than to say Christians are a bunch of hypocrites is to say some Christians are hypocrites. I think I'd agree with that, wouldn't you? I don't want to be one of those people, though. Statements like all people, every time, always, those are usually, usually exaggerations, aren't they? I say usually because there's one exception. There's one place you can use those kind of terms as always. It has to do with God. You know, he's always faithful. You know, uh, never, you know, he'll never leave you for, nor forsake you. You know? Uh, he's perfect in all his ways. His word is secure. He will never vary from it. I mean, you can depend on God, but everything else is variable, isn't it? How often have I heard someone who doesn't even go to church say, Christians are a bunch of hypocrites? Most of those people don't go to churches. A more accurate statement, as I said, would be to say, well, some Christians are hypocrites. And I'd have to say, you're probably right. Most, some, some Christians are hypocrites. What are hypocrites? You got hypocrites in every walk of life. You got all kinds of hypocrites. Christians aren't the only ones that can bear the rap as being hypocrites. You know, I mean, there's atheists that are hypocrites too. You know, there's people out there that uh, uh, you know um, that are high in society as far as the, their business stature and all that. They're hypocrites too. There's people that have an opinion and they don't really live out what their opinion is all about. They live out something else and they're hypocrites too. There's hypocrites everywhere. Hypocrites are fakes. Hypocrites are phonies. They're deceivers. They talk big, but they don't deliver. That is something that should never be said about you or I. I never want it to be said that I'm a hypocrite. You shouldn't want it to be said that you're a hypocrite when it comes to your Christianity. We need to know that we are genuine. We need to know that we're the real thing. We are Christians. We are disciples of Christ. We are followers of, followers of God. And we've been called to live a life honestly before the eyes of the world so that nobody can say we're hypocrites. The people at the Treasury Department who are in charge of watching for counterfeit money are very, very well trained over long periods of time. And how they train them is they study the real thing. They study the authentic. Because if you know the authentic well enough, when a counterfeit comes around, you know it's different. You'll be able to identify it. I want to know what a real Christian looks like. That's what I want to look like, the real Christian. Many people can say, well, I'm a Christian. I'm not a hypocrite, but you need to know, to know what a real Christian looks like, don't you? Just like at the Treasury Department, they need to know what a real $100 bill looks like before they can determine whether something's fake. We need to use the Word of God as a standard to define what a Christian is. We need to compare ourselves with the kind of person that the Bible calls a Christian and to see if we measure up. And if we don't measure up, we need to see if we're willing to change or not so that we might measure up. I want to start with 2 Corinthians 
13.5. So let's turn there. Here's what it says. Examine yourselves. You know, I want you to stop there for a minute. just want to stop there. Christians are really good at examining other Christians. It's easy to find a hypocrite as long as it's not you. That guy's a hypocrite. That guy's a hypocrite. But look at yourself. The Bible says examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Well, aren't I? Test yourselves. You've got to test yourself. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Ooh. So there has to be some self-examination here. And you know what? If I'm going to examine a, a bill, a $100 bill, to determine whether it's counterfeit or not, I better know what the real thing looks like first. Well, if I'm going to examine myself and say, am I in the faith? Am I doing the right thing? Am I living the right life? Am I portraying what I should portray as a Christian? I need to know what a Christian is supposed to look like, don't I? And I need to find out uh, uh, whose opinion really counts anyway. I would think that when it comes to defining a Christian, I would think that the Word of God has probably the best opinion on the matter, right? Not what people say a Christian is, but what the Word of God says a Christian is. What God says a Christian is. That would be much more important. I'm going to begin this series where I ended the last series, the series on love without limits. We ended on talking about the shepherd and his sheep talking about sheep hearing the shepherd's voice, and that's where we're going to start this series. So let's look at John chapter 10, starting with verse 2. Verse 2, John chapter 10. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. Uh, The sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep, by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. It didn't say they might know his voice. It says his sheep do know his voice, and he knows his sheep. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. 14th verse. Jesus says this. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Now, we're going to continue a little bit beyond that verse, but I want to say this first of all. A few things, very simple, is the shepherd is Jesus. He said so. He said, I'm the good shepherd. The shepherd goes in to the sheepfold where all the sheep are, and he knows which one are his. He knows their name. And he calls to them, And it didn't say they hear his voice but don't follow, or they hear his voice and ignore him, or they don't hear his voice. It says they all hear his voice, and they follow him because he's the shepherd. And it says another's voice they aren't going to recognize, and they won't follow him because that's not their shepherd. It didn't say some sheep hear his voice. This is a problem. A lot of people believe they should continue on in their Christian life and, and, and consider it a normal thing that they don't hear the voice of God. That's not the way it's supposed to be. When you were born again, you were born with perfectly good spiritual hearing and spiritual sight if you choose to use it. But can you listen to somebody's voice but not really be listening? Can you hear somebody's voice and be ignoring them? I know that every wife would accuse her husband of doing that. She says something and you go, you weren't even listening. I've heard that over and over. Not, it doesn't happen to me, but... Well, sometimes, sometimes. Okay, so anyway, some people can hear the shepherd's voice and ignore it. But he says, well, you know what? Not only, I, do, I don't want to just qualify what my sheep are by saying they hear my voice, but I want to qualify it a little further by saying, and they follow me. Those are my sheep. They're the ones that actually follow. Not just the ones that hear, the ones that hear and the ones that follow. Now we're going to look at the same chapter, verse 23 through 28. And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews who were gathered around him saying, How long will you keep us in suspense if you are the Messiah? Tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you did not believe. The works 
I do in my Father's name testify about me. Now, Jesus said, I did tell you, and what he's really saying is, but you didn't want to hear it. You didn't listen. I said it. You weren't listening because you didn't want to. 26th verse, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep do listen to my voice. Those are my sheep. I know them, and they follow me. His sheep hear his voice, and they listen to his voice, and they follow him. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Once again, Jesus says, I'm the shepherd, and I have sheep that are mine. And the difference between my sheep and all other sheep are that my sheep hear my voice and follow me. There are a lot of people who hear the shepherd's voice and say, I'm one of his sheep, but they don't follow him. And he says, you haven't met all the qualifications. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And another's voice they will not hear. I think Jesus knows who his sheep are. He's the shepherd. His people are the sheep. The world is his pasture. There are other sheep in this world also, but they're not his sheep. The difference between his sheep and the other sheep is simply this. His sheep hear his voice, and when they hear it, they follow. Those are his sheep. Before we will be able to determine if we are really Christians or not, we'll need to define the word Christian. Is it even in the Bible? You know, I can give you a Webster's Dictionary uh, definition for Christian, but that's what somebody else might say about Christians. I want to know what the Bible says about Christians. Does the Bible ever even use the word Christian? Well, actually, it does. And that is found in Acts 11.26. And this is the first account of anybody ever on the face of the earth being called a Christian. It says this, And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch, so for the whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. There's the word Christian, and it's in the Bible. Now I want to know, what does it mean? It was a Greek word, Christianos. What does it mean? Originally, when that phrase was coined, Christian, that word was coined. What did it mean? Here's what it means. Pretty simple. Followers of Christ. Followers of Christ. Not hearers of Christ. Amen. Followers of Christ. They were called Christians because they were following Christ. We often define Christian in the wrong way. We define it in some definition we've come up with ourselves or the world has imposed upon us. We say, what is a Christian? Many people will say, believers in Christ. That's a Christian. You know, it doesn't even say that. It says they're followers. It doesn't say believers. Now, I'm sure for you to be a follower, you're going to start off believing. Right. But the point is, you can be a believer and not a follower, can't you? You can say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, and not follow him at all, can't you? A Christian is a follower of Christ, not just a believer in Christ. But we say, I'm a Christian because I believe in Christ. Yes, but do you live a life that follows Christ? That's right. Amen. Do you follow his word? Do you follow his commandments? Or do you not listen? Because if you don't listen to his voice and you don't do what he said, then guess what? You're not his sheep. That's right. He said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. Some people don't like the Bible. Because the Bible makes them uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Uh, dead people don't get uncomfortable. Okay? And so there's some people that can hear the word over and over and over and over again. It never phases them. And then there are also people who get uncomfortable and decide, I don't like discomfort, so they leave. But there are some of us who say, I want the truth, even if it costs me something. I want the truth because I don't want to be a fake. I want to be the real thing. And sometimes the word will make you uncomfortable, but that's a good thing. Because if that discomfort causes you to change, then that's for good. Because the end game should be this. We want to be what he wants us to be. We want to be followers of Christ, not Amen. phonies. Amen. So we define Christian sometime as somebody who believes in Christ. The Bible says that the demons believe in Christ also yes. and tremble. Yes. So just believing that Jesus is the Christ is not all there is to it. Right. Being baptized does not make you a Christian. You can be baptized 
and go straight to hell. Some people believe, as long as you're baptized, you're saved. That's not biblical. It's not biblical at all. Being a member of a church does not make you a Christian. It makes you a member of a Christian church. If you're a member of the wrong church, you're not even a member of a Christian church. But to be a member of a Christian church does not allow you free access to heaven. You don't get a free ride to heaven just because you go to church. You are not a Christian because you've attended a Bible college. That's right. That's right. I had a friend who was attending Bible college because he wanted to become a pastor. And uh, he told me something that was quite startling. He said, this is the weirdest thing. There's a number of people going to this college that are atheists. Yes. Why? Well, they want to study religion. But they don't believe any of it. Getting a degree hanging in the wall saying I'm a doctor of divinity doesn't mean a single thing. Being baptized doesn't mean a single thing. Saying I'm a Christian doesn't mean a single thing. Are you a follower? Amen. That's what makes a difference. Amen. We do what he speaks to us through his word. That makes us doers. That makes us followers. We do what he speaks to us by his spirit. That makes us followers. Not just hearing, but following up with the doing. Hearers of the word must be doers of the word, or they're just fooling themselves. And the Bible says that. It says if you hear it, but you don't do it, you're fooling yourself. So don't think you're okay if you hear it, but don't do it. Here's what the scripture says. James 1, 21. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Listen to this. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. But do what it says. You can hear it, but if you don't do it, you're fooling yourself. The more of the word that you hear in church doesn't make you any more saved unless you do something with it. Right? It doesn't bring you any closer to God if you just hear it. It might be good for you to hear it because maybe someday you'll catch on. But if you don't intend on doing it, you're deceiving yourself. Being a Christian does not mean that we just simply keep the rules. It means we follow the leader. Jesus calls us his sheep. There's a great benefit from being one of his sheep. You know, you might say, well, I want to do my own thing. I want to be my own master. Let me tell you this. We are the sheep of his pasture, but there's a world out there. And if you depart from his sheep, guess what? You're amongst wolves. There's a world out there and there's a devil out there and there's uh, destruction waiting those who will not be in the sheepfold of the shepherd. I don't want to be out there on my own without any protection. I don't want to be out there on my own depending on my own devices to save me because I can't do it on my own. I don't want to have to when I get into that hard spot, that tight spot, that pinch where I need help desperately. I don't want to have to say, nobody will look at it, it's going to be me that's going to have to save myself. I have somebody I can look to, the shepherd, because I'm in his fold. I'm in his flock. I follow him. I'm not far from him. So when I call, he hears my voice. He comes and he rescues me. He not only that, he leads me in the right direction so I end up in the right place. He leads me into green pastures so I can have sustenance to eat. He leads me beside the still water so that I can drink. He shelters me and protects me because he actually loves me. And the Bible says he would lay down his life for his sheep. Yes. Right? There's great benefit to being one of his sheep. I don't want to be out in the world. He provides for me. He protects me. He feeds me. And sometimes he beneficially corrects me. Don't like it but it's good for me. Everything that the sheep need to live a long, happy, and contented life, he provides. Being the shepherd means that we, as his sheep, can lean on him. He, we can depend on him for direction. And we know that his direction will always lead us in the safe path. Christians make statements sometimes that can be considered hypocritical. Here's a statement that can often be hypocritical, and you'll be surprised at the statement because... Everybody says this if you're a Christian. Here's a statement that can be very hypocritical. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. 
I would feel safe in saying that many people who say this are half right. He's their Savior, but he's not their Lord. For you to call him your Lord means that you obey him. Means that you submit your will to him. Means that you allow him to direct your life. Meaning that you allow him to speak in your life and you consider what he says as more, having more weight than what you think. It means that you're a follower of him. When you say Jesus Christ is my savior, that might mean you just said the sinner's prayer and just got saved, but is he your Lord? Well, that's what follows, isn't it? That's the part where we submit our will to him. That's the part where we say, whatever you say, I'll do. A lot of people calling Jesus Lord and he's not their Lord at all. You see, for him to be Lord, it means what you're saying is that he has supreme authority in your life to make all your decisions right. and to direct you. It means you bow your knee to his decisions and not Amen. to your own. Amen. Is Jesus a person's Lord if they will not obey him? If they will not follow him? Can they say Lord? Well, you know, well, I could give you my opinion, but I want to tell you what the Bible says about that. So we're going to look at Luke six forty six through 49. This is the Bible. I'm not making it up. I'm not misinterpreting, twisting, you know, coming up with some convoluted concept here. It's plain as day. Here's what it says. Jesus is talking. Think he knows what he's talking about, don't you? He says, I've got a question for you folks. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? You know what? I know a lot of Christians who he could say that to. I know a lot of Christians who call him Lord, but they don't do what he says. They call their own shots. They make their own decisions. They live their own life their own way, and they don't consult him. They go contrary to what his word says you should do, and they do that thing it says you should not do, and yet they call him Lord. He says, i got a question for you. Why are you calling me Lord anyway? Because obviously, it's kind of like you're calling me boss, but you won't obey anything I ask you to do. Well, then I'm not really your boss, am I? I want to tell you the truth. There are some people, and I hope this, does, this shoe doesn't fit for you. There's some people that call me pastor, but really I'm not their pastor at all. Right. Tell you why. The only way I'm your pastor is if you'll consider what I say Amen. and follow. Amen. If you will hear what I say and do your own thing, I'm not really your pastor. Right. And Jesus is probably not really your Lord. Amen. It's those who will submit their will to the ones that are over them. Being the shepherd means that we as a sheep can lean on him. I need to lean on Jesus because, you know, people call Christianity a crutch. I'm going to tell you what. Here's the way it really is. The world is completely lame, and you need a crutch. And you can try alcohol, and you can try drugs, but those won't get you very far. You can try Jesus, and he'll get you all the way to heaven. He's the crutch that you need. So Jesus said in Luke 6, 46 through 49, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, that's a doer, I will show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid a foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed and its destruction was complete. Now what's this talking about? What this is talking about is this, is that when you are really a Christian, you are a hearer and a doer of his word, you are planted solidly on the foundation of Jesus Christ. You're depending on him for your strength. When trials and tribulations come, you'll still be standing when they're over. But those who are just talkers, who are not followers, who just hear the word but don't do the word, he says, you fooled yourselves. When the storm comes, when trials and tribulations come to your life, you're going to completely fail. All of the people that call Jesus Lord are not really his. It doesn't really matter what we call him. What really matters is what he calls us. Matthew 7, 21 through 23 says this. Jesus is speaking again. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, then what's the difference? Is it the one that believes on you? That isn't what it says, actually. It says, but only the one who does 
the will of my Father which is in heaven. In other words, not just the hearer, but the doer. That's the one. Many will say on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Well, you did all kinds of things I didn't tell you to do. The point is, did you do what I told you to do? Uh, We prophesied your name. We drove out demons in your name. We performed many miracles. Then I will tell them plainly, well, you know what? I never knew you. You know why I never knew you? Because you weren't one of my sheep. Because my sheep I know by name. They hear my voice and they follow me and you weren't doing any of that. I've seen programs on television in far off lands, in the Middle East, for example, where people are still herding sheep and that's their livelihood. They are nomadic sometimes and they take the sheep across different lands trying to find more grasses for them to eat. And then sometimes they're out in a very arid place and there's a watering hole and different shepherds, several different shepherds from several different tribes will bring their sheep to the same watering hole because there's not much water around. And the sheep will all come together and they'll all mingle together and mix together and drink. And I'm always thinking, when I see that, it's like, how are you going to sort this all out when you guys got to leave and part? Maybe somebody will get your sheep, you know? Maybe somebody will walk away with 10 of your sheep and, and you'll walk away with five of another guy's sheep. How do you sort this all out? It's really quite simple. They don't need to sort it out. All they need to do, when one of the shepherds says it's time to leave, he calls his sheep, hear his voice, and they separate themselves. And only his sheep will follow him. They separate themselves from the other flocks because they know their master's voice. His sheep know his voice. They separated themselves. You see, the Lord is calling his sheep to come out of the world. To come out of that mindset that we do what everybody else does and we're just like everybody else. And and really, you can't tell us apart from anybody else because we're just like the rest of the world. He says, that's not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I call to them and they come out from those people. And they become different. That's what 2 Corinthians 6, 16 through 18 says. What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? The answer, there is no agreement. For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will live with them. The shepherd lives with them. He walks with them. And I will be their God. He's our shepherd. And they will be my people. You see, the shepherd is with the flock. He walks with the flock. He takes the flock around. Now it says, therefore, come out from among them and be separate. That's the shepherd speaking. The shepherd is saying, come out from amongst those others because you can hear my voice, my sheep hear my voice, and be different. Be doers, not just hearers. I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. The Lord says, come out and be separate. Just like the sheep that had mingled together in my illustration earlier. As we hear his voice, he draws us away from the crowd. We make different decisions than the world makes because we follow the voice of our shepherd. If you hear his voice and you do not follow, then you cannot claim he's your shepherd. You see, he said two things have to occur. He says, my sheep hear my voice. That's the first thing. But he says, and they follow me. That's the second thing. If you hear his voice and you don't follow, he says, then you're not one of mine. Because my sheep follow me. My sheep follow me. He didn't say some of my sheep follow me. He didn't say just the good sheep follow me. He says, my sheep follow me. That's what they do. They hear my voice. They follow me. Those who are his will hear his voice and they'll follow. If you hear his voice and do not follow, you can't claim him as your shepherd. We're living in the last days, the Bible tells us. And now we're living in the last of the last days. It's time to get serious. There's no time to waste time anymore. The Bible says that uh, in the last days, people's love for God is going to wax cold. But it says their love for self is going to get really high. It says they'll be lovers of their own selves, more than lovers of God. We've got to make sure we're not like those people. You see, we are born in a country that has a lot of freedoms. And it's based on our individual rights. And we forget something sometimes. Is in this country you have individual rights and you can do what you want to do as long as it's within the law. You can make your own decisions. And we take that over to Christianity. And that's not the way it is. In God's kingdom, we don't have the right to make all our own choices. We have to follow him. We take that over into our own Christianity and say, I'm going to decide whether I smoke, drink, gamble, do all that other stuff. That's my own thing. God sees me. I'm okay. You know what? You've got to listen to his voice. You've got to do what he says to do. Because you are now a citizen of a whole different kingdom. We need to hear his voice. There are people that uh, 
they say, well, we're in the last days. Okay, well, they've been talking about that for a long time. Well, the Bible says that uh, his coming is nearer than when you first believed. That's for sure. Okay? You're in the last days. What's supposed to happen? It says, don't forsake this assembling of yourselves together, but it says even the more so as you see the day approaching. You'll find that church attendance, actually, for people is more sporadic than it used to be. It's the opposite of what it used to be. It used to be that people would show up for church every Sunday, you know, years and years ago, if they went to church. They were, and now it's like, oh, if there's not a football game, I'll show up. Right? Yeah. I know I'm hurting somebody, but I'm just being honest. He says, the more so as you see the day approaching, step it up. Step, you say, someday when I get all this stuff in order, I'm going to become more spiritual. I'm going to pray more. Someday when I got all this stuff together, I'm going to serve God more and give more to, to the community. Someday when I go all this stuff together, I'm going to read my Bible and study it more. You know what? Someday's never going to come. It has to start now. This is the time to step it up. This is the time to start listening for his voice. This is the time to start following with all your heart, with all your mind, all your soul, and your own strength, because you don't have much time. As the Messiah, Jesus had one simple, straightforward approach when it came to leading his disciples. The first command that Jesus ever gave anybody was a really simple command. The first thing he said, he didn't preface it with a, some sort of seminar saying, here's why you should buy what I'm selling. He didn't do that. He was walking along a seashore, and he said, you, come follow me. But, but, no but, come follow me. He didn't qualify it at all. He said, come follow me. Now, here's the account of that. It's in Mark 1, 16 through 18. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Boy, some kind of obedience there. They didn't even hear the pitch. I'm the Messiah. Here I am. They just followed him. But how many of us know he's the Messiah? How many of us know he's the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings? How many of us know that and still we don't follow he says, come, follow me. The shepherd is the one we're supposed to be following, which means that he has to make the decisions as to where we're going. Because if you make the decisions, then you're driving and he's not. The shepherd is calling out to his sheep today. His sheep are easily identified because they're the ones that hear his voice and follow. Those are his sheep. Those that are not his sheep make themselves obvious too because they're the ones, when he calls, they don't come and they don't follow. My sheep hear my voice. I know my sheep and they know me. Amen. I call my sheep by name. They follow me in another's voice. They will not follow. You know, this takes away an excuse that we have. That the Lord Jesus says, that's not an excuse. Well, I, I'm trying, but I don't hear the voice of the Lord. You know? Well, the Lord says you do hear his voice. Sometimes you will find that if you turn a deaf ear to somebody long enough, you really won't be hearing them at all. Sometimes we don't hear the Lord because we didn't want to hear what he had to say. Sometimes he speaks to us and we are selective in our hearing. We say, I don't want to hear that. I just want to hear that good part with the promises in it. I want to hear the part about you promising me blessings. That's all I want to hear. The stuff about obedience, don't want to hear that. Don't like that. Sometimes we say we can't hear the voice of the Lord because we've already said we won't hear the word that's written in his scriptures. If you don't accept the word in the scriptures... You're going to turn a deaf ear towards God. And when you turn a deaf ear for, towards God, here's what happens. He turns a deaf ear towards you. And your prayers are hindered. And your prayers are not answered. He says, my sheep hear my voice. Well, you know what? He hears his sheep's voice. If you're not his sheep, he didn't hear the voice. We have to be followers, not just talkers. What part of you and I and me does not want to follow? That's your flesh. Your flesh is the thing that's squirming right now, if anything's squirming. Your flesh desires to fulfill its lust, and it has no desire to please God whatsoever. Galatians 5, 16 through 18 says this. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, the flesh is, has a different desire, doesn't it? For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. There's a bit of a war within us. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Led by the Spirit, that means you're not led by the flesh. That means you do what the Lord tells you to do 
and what he's called you to do, and you don't consider the fact, well, by my flesh would rather do this. Is something within you saying, doing, saying this, doing God's will is just too hard? That's your flesh talking. And it's very hard for the flesh to do the will of God. But your spirit is eager. Your spirit, spirit is willing. Your spirit longs to do the will of God. Our flesh is motivated by selfish desires. Our spirit, however, is motivated by a higher nature. It's a hard thing to keep God's commandments and to follow God's directions if we're depending on the strength of the flesh because the flesh is not with the program to begin with. The flesh doesn't want to do it anyway. So don't depend on the flesh to cause you to follow God. There is a way, though, that actually makes it easy to follow the Lord, a way that makes it a pleasure to follow the Lord, a way that makes it fulfilling in the deepest sense of the word. The act of following is easy if you're in love with the shepherd. It makes all the difference. If you're in love enough with somebody, you'll do all kinds of crazy stuff your flesh doesn't want to do just to please them. If you're in love with the shepherd, if you know him intimately, closely, he's your constant companion and your guide. Doing his will is not a problem because you actually want to please the ones you love, don't you? If we try to do it by the power of the flesh, it's a very difficult thing. The love of God is the lubricating oil that causes us to have less friction while we're trying to do his will. See, the flesh is causing all this friction. Don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You get that love in there, it's like, not even listening to you. I want to please him. 1 John 5, 2 says this. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commandments. That's doing, isn't it? In fact, this is the love of God to keep his commands. And his command is not burdensome. Well, it's not burdensome if you're in love with the shepherd. Love makes following easy. It makes it natural. Because your desire is to please the one you love. If you love self more than you love God, then you're going to want to please self. And you're going to want to call your own shots. You're going to want to do your own thing. And you're going to be the shepherd of your own life. And when you're the shepherd of your own life, you can't legitimately say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Can you? You see, the only way David could say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, is that David followed the shepherd. We like to claim that scripture saying, I shall not lack for anything because the Lord is my shepherd. Well, he says, but am I really your shepherd? Because if you're one of my sheep, I'll provide for you. But if you're doing your own thing, not really your shepherd, am I? The sheep hear his voice, and the sheep follow. In the weeks ahead, we're going to be looking at some of the following subjects. The two wills, the will of the dead man and the will of the new man. You'll find that even though you're a new creation in Christ Jesus, there's still some of that old stuff hanging on. You still have your own desires and your own will to do your own thing, and it's in rebellion against God. There are forces that battle within us, And they battle for the right to sit on the throne. Either Jesus is on the throne or you're on the throne. Either Jesus is leading you or you're the leader. But if you're the leader, you're all alone. And I don't want to be all alone. I want to be following the shepherd. Jesus commanded his followers to go and make disciples in the world. This is the thing. If I told a cat, if I could talk to a cat, they could hear me. said, I want you to make a dog. You know, birth a dog. The guy says, I'm a cat. I can't birth a dog. You just can't do that. All right, tell the dog, birth a cat. Can't do it. I'm not a cat. Can't birth what I'm not. I could birth a dog if I'm a dog. I could birth a cat if I'm a cat. The point is this. He said, go and make disciples. You can't make disciples if you're not one. Only a true disciple can make a disciple. We have to first be disciples before we can go out and make disciples. He told us to go and make disciples, and the inference is that we're disciples first of all. Isn't that right? And what's a disciple? The follower. The follower. And the word discipline is in there, isn't it? In disciple. And it means that we adhere to what he taught, and we do it. Go make disciples. People that are not disciples cannot make disciples. The reason for this is simple. You cannot give what you do not have. And you cannot create 
what is not already within you because God's given it to you. And when we try to make the rest of the world conform to the image of Christ, when we're not conforming, it's just a sham. It won't work. What's the first thing we have to do? We go back to the very first scripture. And it said, start off by doing this. Examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith or not. Examine yourself and see if when the shepherd calls to you, do you hear him and do you follow? Because he didn't say some of his sheep hear his voice. He said, my sheep hear my voice. He didn't say some of his sheep follow. He said, my sheep follow. And he said, those that are not my sheep, they don't follow. For some people, that'll be a sobering thing. I think it's good, though, to stir ourselves up. I think it's good to make ourselves a little uncomfortable if it's for a good reason. You know, you want to have a, a, a body like uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something, it's going to take some uncomfortable exercises. But if you want it, there's a payoff, right? You want to be like Christ? You want to be not a hypocrite, but somebody that's genuine, a Christian? Then you're going to have to do some things that sometimes are uncomfortable. But it's worth it in the end. Amen. The results, the payoff is so great, it's worth it. And besides that, all this stuff about, you know, um, um, following him. Oh, that means I've got to give up my own will. Well, your own will will lead you to destruction. So why not follow the one who has the best path for your life? The one who will bless you, who will provide for you, who will protect you. Why not follow the one that knows what he's doing? Because you know what? If I'm following two guys through a minefield and one's got a mine detector and one's just walking, I'm going to follow the guy with a mine detector. Right? Follow him. That's what his sheep do. So today, before we close, I want to say this. There are some Christians here who are not following Jesus, and you need to reconsider this in your life. And you need to find out, too, if your flesh can handle the word of God. Because as I'm challenging you today, your flesh could be saying, I'm not coming here next week. But do you want to be one of his sheep or not? Do you want to be one of his? Do you want to be for real? If you want to be for real, you make yourself do the right thing until it becomes natural. Now, if there's people here today, there's somebody here today who has not asked Jesus into their life to be their Lord and Savior, who has not asked Jesus to forgive them for their sins, this is the beginning of life, is to be cleansed from your sins and to have him come into your heart and be your Lord. If you have not, you shouldn't leave here without doing that. Time is short. The day is now. So if you have not and you would like to make a commitment to Jesus, you'd like to turn your, your messed up life over to him and have him make it a beautiful thing, then I would ask you to raise your hand and we will pray for you right now. We're not going to make you sign any documents, pay any money. We're going to pray for you and God's going to do a transformation. So raise your hand if you would like prayer. Anybody at all? All right, then I would like to have you bow your heads for a few moments. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord Jesus, for your voice. Thank you for your word that speaks to us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that directs us and guides us, Lord. Lord, we ask today that as these words have entered our minds, they will enter our hearts, and they will become seeds that are planted deeply, and they will take much root, Lord Jesus, and that they will bear much fruit, Lord. Water those seeds, cause them to grow in us, Lord that we might become your disciples, we might become more like you, and we might be the sheep of your pasture that hear your voice and that follow you, Lord. Lord, for those of us who have an unwilling heart, Lord, I just ask that you work on that heart and that you make us, Lord, make us, Lord, willing to be willing. At least say, Lord, I'm not willing, but I want to be willing, so help me, Lord. Help me. Help my heart to change, Lord, so that I can be that person that says, yes, Lord, I'll follow you. And we thank you for what you're doing through these words today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Step up your commitment. By coming Wednesday, you will not be sorry. See you next week.